I now look to Edward Mortimer to continue the case for the opposition. Thank you, Mr. President. I must say, I think we've heard very strong and impressive speeches on both sides of this motion. Uh, and I think that none of us would pretend that the UN doesn't have extremely serious failings, uh, and some of them have just been outlined by Miranda Brown, for whom I have enormous respect. And, and I fully agree with her last remarks about the need for stronger action, uh, which I do believe the new Secretary General will undertake. Some actions are already being undertaken. But I think we have to think carefully about what this motion means. What are we meaning by failure in this context? Of course, uh, all institutions fail in some degree. And um, it's as e very easy to say the UN is failing to do this or to do that. <clears throat> I think that to define it as a failing institution generically, which I think is what this motion seeks to do, uh, you need to go further. And basically, if you support that motion, you're saying this is a worthless institution. Um, we can do without it. We can do better. We can find a more successful one. And I hesitate to, oh, I wonder if any of us feel confident that they can say that. I worked in the UN for eight years between 1998 and 2006, and I saw a number of things uh, where I felt that the UN was achieving something important which no other institution could do, and I'd like to give a few examples. Has anybody here heard of the Bokassi Peninsula? Well, be grateful that you haven't, because uh, there could very well have been a serious war between Nigeria and Cameroon about the Bakassi Peninsula. Kofi Annan, as Secretary General, spent a great deal of time negotiating with the heads of state of Nigeria and Cameroon to avoid that dispute becoming a violent conflict and adding to the sum of wars in Africa. It didn't make any headlines, nobody reported it, but that was just as well, and that is part of the function of the United Nations. Everybody has heard of HIV AIDS, and certainly the UN can't claim to have saved the world from HIV AIDS. But Kofi Annan, as Secretary General, got together in his office the heads of all the big pharmaceutical companies in the world. And at the time, they were charging prices for antiretroviral drugs, which were completely unaffordable to people living in poor countries. And they were basically doing this because none of them wanted to uh, lose out to um, competition from the others. And he said to them, look, what you charge in rich countries is fine, but you can agree to make these drugs available uh, in, in poor countries at affordable prices. And they did agree, and there are probably quite a few thousand people, particularly in Africa, who are alive today as a result of that doesn't say in the Charter of the United Nations that that's the job of the Secretary General. But nobody except the Secretary General of the UN could do that because these people wouldn't trust anybody else to do it. The UN has still, in spite of all its failings, a unique legitimacy in the world because of its universal membership. Now, that sounds very airy-fairy and abstract. And I remember uh, when um, the Iraq war happened in 2003, a lot of people thought, well, 
that's the end of the UN, you know, this notion about legitimacy is for the birds. Um, we, America and Britain, have shown that we don't need the authority of the Security Council. We can move in and deal with an odious dictator like Saddam Hussein, who is threatening uh, his neighbourhood and potentially the world. Various things happened in Iraq following the invasion. And the coalition provisional authority, which was the occupation power ru running Iraq, was very anxious in 2004 to hand over to a sovereign government. The problem was that they needed, they didn't have time to organize elections. They'd said they were going to do this in June 2004. And Ayatollah Sistani, who was the most respected, and still is, the most respected leader of the Shia, with a majority in Iraq, said, you can't hand over to an appointed government. It's got to be an elected government that represents the people. And Sistani said, the, the Americans said, well, sorry, you know, we can't organize a proper election in that time, and this would mean delaying the handover. He said, I don't believe you. I won't believe you unless the United Nations tells me so. Now, by that time, the leadership that the UN had sent into Iraq to try and help with the reconstruction of the country had been blown up by terrorists in, the, uh, in its headquarters in Baghdad in August uh, 2003. So you can imagine that the UN was not very keen to send anybody back into Iraq in those circumstances. I was present at a meeting in the basement of the United Nations building when Bremer, Jeremy Greenstock, Ahmad Chalabi, Abdulaziz al-Hakim, Adnan Pachachi, in other words, Everybody who was anybody in the government of Iraq at that moment came and did everything short of actually going down on their knees to Kofi Annan to say, please send us somebody to convince Sistani that we can do this and that we can form a legitimate, credible government to whom to hand over. And these were many of them people who had really wanted to brush the UN aside only a few months before. That's what legitimacy is about. And I don't think there's any other organization that can provide that. So I have a fairly short and simple message for you this evening. In 1933, this house, the Oxford Union, famously passed a resolution saying that it would not fight for king and country. I'm sure it seemed quite a clever thing and not an unreasonable thing for a generation that had grown up in the shadow of the First World War. But the news that this august body had taken that view resonated around the world. And some people even say that it convinced Hitler that Britain would not fight. If you at this moment in world history, when international order is threatened by forces of xenophobia, uh, authoritarian rulers who are reluctant to accept the idea of international law and cooperation, if you pass a motion which effectively says that you're writing off the UN as a failing institution, I fear that that news also may resonate around the world and may make it more difficult for Antonio Guterres and the people who are going to be trying to work with him to achieve the mission of the UN in the years to come. That would be quite a heavy responsibility to take. Thank you very much.